How exactly can blockchain establish identity or proof of personhood? This is actually a more complicated problem than you might think, but it's really important if we want to sort of overcome some of these problems with bots or sock puppets being able to take over an online space. And in this video, I'm going to go through eight mechanisms that come from the article that I'll link to below called Who Watches the Watchman? Which basically explains subjective means of establishing that a person is a real human being and not a bot, not a sock puppet. And I actually think this is one of the most important problems we want to solve if we want to create some sort of online governance system that can improve the quality of our online spaces. If we want to keep troll farms out of our information sphere, if we want to create more just alternatives to the big tech monopolies, or even just hold them accountable to the power they're exerting on us, then we need some alternative spaces. And the key to making those spaces work really is having some version of online identity. So just to be clear about what exactly I'm talking about, I kind of view this as your identification if you want to join a platform where you have a platform that maybe it's a social media company or maybe it's a marketplace or some other tech platform. And you go to sign up for the tech platform and it says, prove that you're a human being, prove that you're not a bot that's going to just take over this space for your own objectives. And you show this ID which might just be a long key of letters and numbers. And the platform can say, okay, I'll take your key, I'll check it against some sort of registry that registers real human beings. And this whole system needs to do this without attaching this to your real world identity or without giving away too much personalized information. So here are the three goals we're trying to achieve when we come up with this online identity. First, it needs to be easy for humans to produce, but hard for machines to produce. This is basically the anti-bot mechanism. Second, it needs to be easy for humans to produce once, but not that easy for humans to create a whole bunch of identities. A sock puppet is basically where one person owns a whole bunch of different accounts that they try to use um, to achieve their own goals. And then third, it needs to involve minimal or zero use of personal identification information. We don't want our address or our social security number or something like that floating around online or attachable to the identity we're using to get into the platforms. So that's the goal here. The question is, what are the mechanisms blockchain could use to actually prove you're a person? I will be talking about eight such mechanisms that the blockchain community is currently experimenting with. I'm sure this whole space is going to evolve, but I think understanding these eight will give you a sense for the difficulty of the task and also just a sense of hope that this could eventually pan out. So the first mechanism is puzzles. This is like CAPTCHAs that you fill out when you're trying to prove your identity online, where you have to identify which of these pictures have a fire hydrant or which of these pictures are bridges. Those are basically little puzzles that artificial intelligence cannot yet solve. But of course, there's an irony here because with CAPTCHAs, it's taking in information that can then be fed to the artificial intelligence to eventually be able to solve those better and more accurately than humans can. So in some ways, this is an arms race between what kinds of puzzles can humans solve and what kinds of puzzles can artificial intelligence solve. And if you're going to use this kind of mechanism, you may be just a couple steps ahead of what the artificial intelligence can do, and you constantly have to be updating those puzzles. The second mechanism for establishing identity is real-world face-to-face parties. And for these, you basically show up to an in-person barbecue or party, and the person issuing the identity sees with their own eyes that you're a real person in front of them, and they hand you a key. 
and that key of course can be used online to establish your identity. Now of course there's limitations to this because you have to be sort of physically in the same geographical space or you're not going to be able to create an identity. And perhaps you could get around this by hosting sort of simultaneous parties in many different population centers, such that everybody had an opportunity to show up to one. That would be one way of doing it, but of course it's imperfect, it's onerous. The third mechanism is actually very similar, except you don't have to show up to face-to-face -face parties. Instead, you can show up online, and maybe you show up on Zoom, or maybe you show up and do a little puzzle, but there's sort of a window of time, like a 15 minute window of time, that wherever you are in the world, you show up for that, and if you do what is required in that little time frame to prove your identity, then you get a key. The fourth mechanism here is the circle of trust mechanism, where you basically know that you and your group of friends that you have a real personal relationship with are real people. So you say to each of them, hey, we know we're real. Each of you can identify five people in your life who you know are real, and you can invite those people to join the network. You can give each of them a key. And then those five people that we know are real, they're allowed to give sort of five invites or 10 invites or whatever. That's the circle of trust where you're hoping everybody's going to be honest. Now, you can add mechanisms on top of this. For example, you could say, okay, you have to stake a little bit of money that these are five real people. And if we later prove one of your invites to be a bot for some reason, then you lose that money. So you can set up financial stakes and financial incentives to try to incentivize honesty, but of course there's flaws in every system. The fifth strategy for establishing identity is going to be using a compilation of people's current social media profiles. Now, of course, this one does have the privacy issue where obviously these profiles may be associated with personal identification and links to your real world identity in a way that is not optimal. But nonetheless, this is something that we see in use. Um, you can even think of when was the last time you tried to join some sort of platform, some sort of social media company, or even purchase a product, and you had to link whatever you're doing to your Facebook account or your Google account or some existing social media company. And when that happens, one of the reasons for that is that it, it takes a lot of money to invest in something that sort of proves your identity. And these big tech monopolies have already invested a lot of money in that. So by tapping into that, you're already kind of piggybacking on their initial investment. So because we're seeing this in so many places, some people are like, why not just use the same mechanism in the blockchain space? Now the sixth mechanism is a little bit like that, and this one has to do with biographical evidence of your, your personhood. So this could be a video of you telling the story of your life, or it could be a fingerprint or a thumbprint, or it could be photographs from you growing up. Now this has some of the same weaknesses as the social media version of establishing identity. Obviously some of these could be connected with your real world in-person identity. That could violate privacy. There is also an issue of artificial intelligence. And can artificial intelligence come up with a convincing video that looks like a real human being telling their story? And if that's not possible right now, it's probably going to be possible at some point in the near future. So once again, not a perfect mechanism. The seventh mechanism that I'm seeing is the human score. And this is basically, if you look at a whole bunch of data about a person's behavior on a platform, or their behavior online, or their purchasing patterns, or something, you can come up with a score that captures what's the probability that the person generating this data, this information, is a human being rather than a bot. And 
when I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking about those credit card scores that can sort of score what's the probability that any given purchase is a purchase by you. And if they see a purchase that doesn't look like it's from you, you get a phone call or a text from your credit card company saying, it looks like there's suspicious activity, our algorithms has assigned a score to this, and we don't think this is you. And of course, you can confirm that it's you, because none of us is a stereotype of ourselves. Sometimes we surprise the algorithms. That's just part of being a human. But you might imagine um, these same algorithms that work for the credit card companies could be used um, with different data inputs to sort of assign a score to what's the probability that this behavior is bot behavior versus a real unique human behavior. And of course, the human score is going to get better with more and more data. So I even think about Reddit's uh, scoring system, where the longer you have been on Reddit and the more you've posted, the more your posts look like a real person, the higher your score is. So there is a connection between a human score and your history with any given network. And then the eighth mechanism is the mix and match mechanism. The article refers to this as intersectional identity. And this is basically where you use a bunch of different mechanisms. Like you take the other seven mechanisms and you create some kind of identity that triangulates your probability of being a human being. So maybe one of the mechanisms has one type of weakness, a different mechanism has a different type of weakness. When you put them together, you sort of increase the validity of that system for establishing identity. Now, I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit about the problems with these mechanisms and the broad categories of problems to watch out for if you're watching some sort of proof of personhood system evolve. The first problem is that some of these violate privacy. And that even includes some of them that you might not think would violate privacy. For example, the circle of trust mechanism for establishing identity, where you give the name of five people that you believe are real people, um, that mechanism is connecting you with other people in a way that some systems could sort of back out from that who you are. The second mechanism is the fact that artificial intelligence is going to get better and better and better. And therefore, there is an arms race between all of these mechanisms and artificial intelligence's ability to sort of fake each of the mechanisms. The third potential problem is that people could sell their identities. There's probably some people who don't really care about having the online identity. And if they could get 20 bucks from going through the hoops of establishing their identity and selling that to a bigger player, some people might choose to do that. The fourth problem to watch out for is, for some of these, it's quite onerous to keep your identity up to date. What often happens with these party-based identity systems is that you're required to keep your identity up to date because otherwise people could just show up every four weeks or every six weeks or whenever these parties happen and they could simply establish a new identity every, every month or whatever and just accumulate identities over time knowing that those identities could eventually be, be numerous enough to sort of sway a system or to sell to other players. So to prevent that, sometimes these systems will say, yeah, you do have to show up every six weeks to sort of uh, revalidate your identity, that you're a real person. In which case, you have to make sure that the value of establishing your identity outweighs the, the effort of showing up to the parties that often. The next thing to watch out for is, is there an advantage to any of these systems to being rich? Like, if you're rich or wealthy or have more connections, can you come up with a circle of trust more easily? Or can you pay someone to establish identities for you? So it's worthwhile just keeping in mind 
does the system treat the rich and the poor equally? And then the final risk to watch out for is the avalanche exit risk. This is basically where the system is kind of a house of cards, where once you discover that one person that you thought was a real person, that you gave an identity to, is actually a bot. Does the whole system collapse when you discover that? And you might imagine the circle of trust-based system would be one like this. If you had an initial five people, and each of them had five people, and each of them had five people, well, what if you discover that one of these people somewhere along the way is a bot? Does that mean everybody who got an identity that was attached to that person uh, is no longer valid in the system? In which case, you can have systems collapse fairly quickly. And that's not the only mechanism that can lead to an avalanche exit or a collapse. So thinking about the game theory and the incentives and when an identity should be revoked, how exactly it's revoked, how much evoking an identity um, affects people who are connected with that identity, all of these are questions that blockchain developers and system designers are going to have to think about. So that's just an overview of the article. It's worth noting that none of these systems have worked out so far. None of these systems have more than a few thousand people on them, and none of them have that much time under their belt. And of course, we know for a system to develop validity and trust, it needs to sort of be out there, it needs to be used by many people, it needs to be tested against attackers. Basically, the longer an identity-based proof of personhood system exists, the more trustworthy it is. There's an element of anti-fragility involved in this. 